Hello and welcome to our last lesson on Chapter 6, How Enzymes Work. In this lesson we want to look at the activation of chymotrypsin. We find that chymotrypsin is a good example of proteases that are synthesized as inactive precursors. In other words, as it's synthesized off the ribosome, it is inactive and requires to become activated as an enzyme. These are called zymogens because they can be generated as active enzymes. In other words, they're activated only when and where they're needed. Some activate themselves. This is referred to as autoactivation, in which case the active form of the enzyme converts an inactive to an active form. Let's see how that works in the case of chymotrypsin. As it's synthesized from the ribosome, it's chymotrypsinogen. This is the zymogen form. And as you can see at the top of the screen here, it contains 245 amino acid residues. The first event to occur is hydrolysis by trypsin that breaks the peptide bond between residues 15 and 16. Those are arginine and isoleucine residues. And that converts inactive chymotrypsinogen to active pi chymotrypsin. At this point, then, chymotrypsin takes over the activation and auto-activates itself. In the first step, it's going to clip out a 2-amino acid dipeptide, serine and arginine, residues 14 and 15, and that converts it from pi to delta chymotrypsin. Note that both of these are active forms. In the final step, chymotrypsin does one more cut, and that's pictured in lime green here. It's going to cut out the dipeptide threonine asparagine, and those are residues 147 and 148. And here we have the final form, alpha chymotrypsin. Note that chymotrypsinogen is the, the inactive form, and pi, delta, and alpha are all active forms. I would also like to point out that although alpha chymotrypsin looks here as if there are three separate polypeptides, they're all peptide fragments that are connected by disulfide bonds, so it's all still part of the same protein. The benefit of this type of activation is that the protein has already been synthesized and it's ready to go. It only has to be activated. Let's think for a moment about the benefit of that. Imagine if instead of this, in order to have active chymotrypsin, we had to actually synthesize the protein from scratch. In that case, let's say you ate a nice big meal and it contained a nice big hamburger. Remember, chymotrypsin digests peptide bonds, so we're going to need that enzyme. So now we've eaten the meal. Now we have to send a signal to the nucleus so that we can convert the DNA into messenger RNA. That message has to be transported to the cytoplasm so that it can be translated into protein, and then the protein has to be sent where it needs to go. Well, by now that hamburger's been sitting in the bottom of your stomach, and now you have indigestion because you had to wait to make the protein. So the benefit of having an inactive form of a protein or enzyme is that it's there when you need it. All you have to do is activate it. In this case, clip, clip here, clip, clip there. Now we have active chymotrypsin and we can digest that protein, that hamburger that we ate. Another way that proteases are controlled is by protease inhibitors. A good example here is the enzyme trypsin in gold here, and there's a trypsin inhibitor in green. It resembles the substrate very closely, so it can bind to the active site, but there's no reaction. In other words, it blocks the activity of the enzyme, and so they're called protease inhibitors. So we'll see that proteases that digest proteins are controlled in many ways, and that's because we want to be very careful about which proteins we digest and when. So the chymotrypsin activation cascade is a very common theme in biological systems. Another good example from your book is the clotting cascade that eventuates in the formation of fibrin clots, and that's this electron micrograph that you, s that you see in the bottom of your slide here. So let's see how that cascade works, and that's illustrated on the far right here. What's going to initiate the whole sequence of events is a thrombin molecule. It's going to convert an inactive X1 to active X1A. And a molecule of active X1A 
will convert inactive 1x to 1xA, and so forth down the line until we get to the final molecule, fibrin. Now let's think for a moment about the benefit of this kind of a complex cascade. So let's imagine we have 10 molecules of thrombin, and it will in turn uh, activate 10 molecules to form X1A. So by now we've amplified our effect tenfold. If we do that for every step of this cascade, because there are so many steps, one molecule of thrombin might be responsible for producing a million molecules of fibrin. So hopefully you can see that by having these several steps, this cascade of events, we can produce a very large effect in a very small time frame. And for something as important as clotting, it can make a significant impact on the human body. And so it's very important we control it and that we make it happen as quickly as possible. I'd also like to point out that although we have illustrated here all the steps in this clotting cascade, you're not responsible for the details, only for the significance of these events. So there's an amplifying effect in these biochemical cascades. It's as if we brought several rivers together to produce a very large waterfall, so we get a large effect in a very short time frame. We'll see this as an ongoing theme in biochemistry, and what I want you to remember from all of these things is just the significance, not the details. This concludes our studies in Chapter 6. We'll begin our studies of enzyme kinetics in Chapter 7 in our next video lesson. We want first of all to determine how we can measure an enzyme's activity. We also want to consider what controls the rate of an enzymatic reaction and how we can derive an expression for that rate.